Welcome to the Engage Bible Podcast, hosted by the Roots Community Church. The Engage Bible Podcast exists to perpetuate knowing Scripture. Our hope is that through this podcast, you would be inspired to personally engage with your Bible and with fellow believers in conversation about Scripture. You can find out more about the Engage Bible Reading Plan and even download and print your own copy at engage.theroots.church. You can also contact us at engage at therootscommunity.com. Welcome to episode 41 of the Engage Bible Podcast. This is Casey Ball. I'm here with Russ Newkirk. And a huge semi that just drove by a second ago, so you yeah. probably got that awesome noise. We're recording... In a semi plant, <laughs> a semi plant. <laughs> yep. Um, today we're going to be looking at John's Gospel chapters three through four, um, James chapters four and five, and um, starting First Peter, and we're going to look at just chapter one, also known as much more than we'll get through. Totally, totally. So let's start in John. Um, so John three. Um, we're not going to look at. Um, <laughs> we're just going to go straight to four. Four's got um, just an awesome story that we want to look at. Um, chapter three, he meets um, Nicode- Nicodemus. Nicodem- I almost said Nicodemus. <laughs> you're thinking McDonald's. Why yeah. are you thinking Nicodemus? So that it's sounds Mick- delicious. Nicodemus. Uh, so Nicodemus, and uh, you have the famous John 3.16 um, buried in there. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Which uh, is some but, good stuff. I wish we had time to get into all of it, but that would not allow us to get into some other things that I think will be exciting to get into today. Yeah. So chapter four, it may be uh, titled in your Bible as Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. Um, so let's talk about it. Where do you want to start reading? Um, I think we should start probably verse five. Go ahead. Uh, It says this, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, that's my best shot at it, Uh, near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jacob's well was there. Brianna used to work at, uh, my wife Brianna used to work at a um, coffee shop in downtown Olympia that had bands come play, and there was one called Jacob's Well. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Were they local? Uh, Like... Not super local. They weren't from here. They drove down from up north somewhere, but I don't know where. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Wait, stop there for just a second. Okay. Or were you already going to stop there? No. I think it's awesome that we see Jesus physically tired, thirsty, and hungry. He's tired, it already said, Mm -hmm. from his journey. And then he says, will you give me a drink, mm-hmm. showing that he's thirsty. And the disciples went to go get food because he's hungry. Just shows the, the he's fully God and fully man. It's awesome. Yeah. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan mm-hmm. woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So Jews didn't associate with Samaritans because um, the Jews were basically racist. I was going to say they're racist jerks. Um, what's going on. And, uh, and Samaritans didn't associate with them either. I mean, Samaritans also weren't real nice to Jews. But I don't know. S- Samaritans were Jews and Gentiles that a mix. It, that mixed. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. But it was mostly the Jews looking down their nose. You're right. It was yeah. mostly them being. Well, because there was so racist. much value in the Jewish people of having pure Jewish blood. Right. So, um, and then. You know, in this time, men didn't speak to women. Sure. Um, so there's so Jews kind of didn't two, speak to Samaritans. There's a social in, right. social border that's being crossed. There's right. a gender um, kind of social hierarchy that right. is being crossed. I wrote down um, Jesus crosses man made boundaries. Like that's what is going on here. That's cool. Nice. Um, we're at verse ten. Uh, yeah. Jesus answered her, "If you knew the gift of God." And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, stop again. <laughs> it's so crazy. Like, Jesus is talking in third person. <laughs> Instead of just saying, if you knew who I was, 
Mm-hmm. He says, if you would have known who, mm-hmm. then he would have. Mm-hmm. And it's him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just kind of interesting the way he's saying it. It's all in third person. Sir, the woman asked, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. <laughs> Where can you get this mm. living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as uh, did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It almost seems like Jesus and the Samaritan woman are having two different conversations. Like she's, she, Jesus asks for a drink of water. Mm. Her response is like, should you even ask me that? Mm-hmm. Right. So, and then Jesus goes all third person and says, if you knew who I was and the gift of, uh, that's with you, mm-hmm. you would ask me. And her response back is, are you greater than our father Jacob? But mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't like doesn't answer. straightforward yeah. answer. Doesn't just go, he like the answer is yes. Right, right. He just, yes, yeah, I am. I'm yeah. better. Like, here's why. <laughs> but then he almost seems like he's having his own conversation, right? Yeah. Everyone who drinks this water, like, he, does, he doesn't address the actual question there. Um, and whoever drinks the water, I give them, which I think is cool because he goes away from me pulling water out of this well. Mm-hmm. She's still stuck on, you can't even get water out of this well, right? And the water I give them will, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then again, it seems like she, you know, he's, he's now talking on an eternal level, on a spiritual level. Right. She doesn't understand it all, but it makes sense. Like her answer kind of makes sense. Cause he mm-hmm. says, you know, you, just, you have to keep coming out here. I can give you water that you don't have to come, keep coming to, to this. And, and she's like, well, yeah. Right. Give me some of that. Right. There's another, I forget where it is off the top of my head, but there's another place that I've preached through that is kind of similar to this in terms of Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't answering in these like human ways. Like we would have a conversation. Totally. He actually does He's with Pharisees a lot too. on a really high level um, and talking about deep spiritual things in a normal conversation. Right. Um, which I think is something that we can learn from. Yeah. I mean, sometimes he does it in a way people don't understand. Sure. So that's difficult. But he's going to lead this woman to believe in himself. Right. Totally. Which is evangelism. Sure. Um, So so, verse 15. Yeah. Um, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so, so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So you're just thinking, this sounds easier. Yeah, yeah. Give me that. Yeah. She doesn't one, get it. Can I get one of yeah. those? Eternal mm-hmm. life to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> eternal life to go. Uh, one eternal life to go. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> he told her, this is where the conversation <laughs> gets funny. Yeah. <laughs> he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband. No, on replied. some level that would make sense. Okay. So at first, when we see it, it seems weird. But in that day, if if men and women didn't talk... There was this idea of even like the, hey, women should learn from their husbands. Women should just um, not talk in public in these spaces. They should only talk to their husbands. Um, Part of that is culturally Mm -hmm. makes sense in that statement he makes of like she says, okay, I want something from you. And he says, well, go get your husband. Now, obviously, he knows more. He's planned more before that. But I don't think she would necessarily think that was a weird statement. Sure. Potentially, because mm-hmm. you kind of see throughout scripture similar spaces in the culture, right? When they're coaching on what it looks like inside of the church or how men and women relate to each other, that there's this kind of covering of the man and you go through the man mm-hmm. in conversation. On some level, we still do that. F- for As a man, if you have a problem with my wife, if it's a big problem, you better come talk to me. Right. Does that sound... Like, I'm going to get in trouble for this on a podcast? I don't know. I don't think either of our three listeners are going to have a problem. <laughs> our moms <laughs> definitely are going to agree. So I mean, You know what I mean? There's a level of that, like, headship that's still real and relevant. In that sure. culture, it was much more over the top. But um, so he asks, go get your husband. But he knows it's going to lead to a follow-up, right? Yeah. So keep going. You're doing great. I have no husband, she replied. This is where it gets like super. So I just cool. wrote Jerry Springer. 
Jerry Springer. Uh, I wrote, Jesus reads her mail. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Jesus said to her, but it's like, it's totally this, like the episode sure, of Maury, sure. you know, and it, it gets like wild and the, cr- the crowd goes nuts. Uh, <laughs> Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said, what you have just said is quite true. That's, I'm trying to wrestle through, um, I think you just compared Jesus to Jerry Springer and more. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the episode title. Oh, no. Um, uh, no, I think this is so amazing. Obviously, Jesus knows uh, on a level of beyond um, where we're at as yeah, far yeah. as his discernment and understanding kind of this prophetic mm-hmm. space where he's... Um, Saying it's interesting that she makes a statement and then to say something about yourself and have somebody go, that's right. And here's why you're that's right about you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just kind of a interesting conversation, right? Yeah. So now he's just kind of called her on the carpet yeah. and, uh, and she's going to have a response for it. Go for it. Sir. The woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Again, that makes sense because of what he just said. Mm-hmm. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. So she kind of shifts gears. And I don't know if it's because she's trying to get the topic off of herself and her five husbands mm-hmm. um, or if she legitimately is like, oh, wait, maybe this guy can answer a question for me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then Jesus uh, says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And then the woman has this kind of great line. I mean, she has, she, she, knew, she knew to look but didn't see, right? So it says, mm. the woman said, I know that Messiah or the anointed one and the anointed king called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared this powerful line. Mm -hmm. I, the one speaking to you, I am he. It's awesome. Yeah. On so many levels. And maybe you've heard some of these scriptures before. Maybe you haven't. Um, But it's great when you just think of the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. And, um, and just like, what is the, what kind of, Worship should we give to the God? I think too often we think of worship just as in song. You know what I mean? Right. So we're like, oh, yeah, so when you sing, make sure it's in spirit and in truth. Like mm-hmm. worship is this bowing down to the Lord. And, um, you know, the way they're doing it here and the way they're saying it is you have to do it in Jerusalem. You have to do it on this mountain. This is what we've kind of wrestled through. Um, so you can see that there's actually some some steps and some order of the worship they're talking about. Which would be like temple worship. Just talking or, about temple worship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's saying that yeah, there's this temple worship, but what God is really looking for, right, is at the heart. Like, yeah, is this person really worshiping Him in spirit and in truth? Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is powerful. I love that it says the Father seeks that too. Mm. You just almost get this picture of God looking, even though God knows where everyone's at, right? Like, um, but but wanting that, yeah. It's cool. And there's even that, like, just thinking through the, the breaking down of the normal temple customs right. that had always been in place. And, and yet um, Jesus, all throughout his ministry, was kind of, like, letting his followers know, like, hey, we're not going to have to do that anymore. Um, right. Because wherever we're worshiping, like, that's that's where God is. Right. Um, right. There's, like, the ceremonial washings, and he said, uh-huh. you know, he's going to baptisms. It's kind of kind of be part of that yeah. new look. Um, uh-huh. There's the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. There's uh-huh. the high priest. He is the high priest. Right. <laughs> like There's the presence. He is there. And right. present, you know what I mean? And so, um, and that's what's great there when he says, it will come and it now has come. Mm-hmm. And he's literally standing there. Right. <laughs> it's great. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I just love the clarity of what is said in, in verse 26. And yeah. it makes me think of... And we talked about this a while back, but I wonder how um, my Jehovah's Witness friends, who I hope are, are going to come back to my 
doorstep sure. um, in the near future deal with this line. Um, how, I think, though, they, they, sometimes they would say, yes, translates he translates it different. Maybe. Yeah. Or they would say he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Mm-hmm. But that still he's not somewhere in between eternally that. Right. right, right. And yeah. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Let's move to. No, we can't. No? No. Why? Because the story's not done. Okay. We just gave people part of a story. Well, I think we Just can... then, the disciples returned and, when, and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. We've already talked about why. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? But this is, this is huge. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. There's a lot in that, and I don't want to get too preachy, although I do want to get too preachy. Um, Christ is revealed, or at least she's has this understanding now that this guy just said he's the Messiah. Um, and she drops everything. She had a purpose, had a plan, had a task, had a chore, had a job. And after running into or having an experience with Jesus, she literally stops what she was doing. Mm-hmm. The water jars that she brought out to bring water back, she just left there because something that was of more most importance had interrupted her regular pattern. Mm-hmm. And so she goes back, and I love what she says, come see. Mm-hmm. And there's this testimony of, like, I got exposed. <laughs> like, who I am got exposed, and I think it's, geez, I think it's the Messiah. Um, you should come check it out. Yeah, yeah. And so they come out, and then there's this piece which i don't think we should get into right now although i'd love to this dialogue between jesus and the disciples um and then in verse 39 it says many of the samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony Mm -hmm. he told me everything i ever did so when the samaritans came to him they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days and because of his words many more became believers so now there's this a bunch of these samaritans that believe in jesus they said to the woman This is so awesome. We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Boom. So there's this transference. Like their faith before was a faith based in the testimony that she had had an experience with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now this faith is, we don't just believe because you told us we should. We believe because it's been revealed to us that he's the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. I think that's so good for us. I'm I'm not saved through somebody else's belief in him being the savior now it might spur something for me and them saying like you have to come check this out mm-hmm. might might draw me in but really there's this level of me needing to experience the risen jesus like there's this revealing of christ by god to me that i go man i, I kind of believed before because of what you said but now i believe mm-hmm. he's the savior of the world and so it's, it's a great story of the, in the life of Christ that I think we can learn from. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I wanted to finish that piece of the story. I love it. Now let's move. James. James, here we come. So James is kind of, you awesome. guys have noticed. <laughs> I love James. A little bit of a bully. <laughs> oh, I love him. Um, yeah. He just never, I mean, he's, I don't, I don't remember if he does, but he doesn't um, really use verbiage. I use the word consider back here, but it's consider pure joy when things are hard, basically. (laughs) But it's not like, hey, think about doing this or maybe this. He just says, like, do this. If you do this other thing, you're dumb. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, like, here's what it looks like. Do it. If you don't, you probably don't even know who Jesus is and care. He seems like he'd be just kind of a, a, like a very... Do you think he's just black um, and white? Intense person to yeah, be around. Yeah, totally. Yeah, everything's super black and white right. with him. Um, yeah, it's either, it's right and wrong. Four, it's yeah. wise or unwise. Mm-hmm. It's it's either active faith or it's dead. Mm-hmm. Like, he's, Well, and he's calling out different types of people sure. throughout his letter, too, because sure. he's writing to anyone. Mm. Um, yeah. So, chapter four. Um <laughs> I mean, let's just start with verse one. What yeah. causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they co- come from your desires that battle within you? Mm-hmm. Man, that's so awesome. Think about your personal relationships. A lot of the fights you end up having with other people is because of the fights inside of yourself. Yeah, because you're selfish. Yeah, you desire, but do you not? You do not have, so you kill. 
you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you fight. Mm-hmm. You do not have because you do not ask God. Casey, did you want to pack that? unpack that? Yeah. No, it uh, really means that if you uh, ask for it, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It's interesting where you even seem to be talking that. about specific things. Uh-huh. Like what you want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? You desire something, you don't get it, so you kill. Mm-hmm. You covet something. It's, it seems like tangible things he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And then and then even when you do ask for it, like some things you're asking for, God's not giving you because your heart's wrong. Which well, is cool. I mean, then he says you'll spend what you get. Like you're asking God for money. That's what I mean. That's what it he, seems like stuff. It yeah. seems like things. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah. And then and then he kind of nails down. <laughs> the next line there, you, you adulterous, adulterous people, people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Hmm. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God, which is so good because I think a lot of what he's going after is that worldly materialism. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, you're just being like everybody else. And you're asking God to help you be like everybody else. And he's not answering and you're mad about it. So you want to fight. It's crazy. That's funny. Yeah. So... um, yeah, it's good stuff. And then um, verse 7 and yeah, seven and 8. Why don't you jump into that? 7 and 8 is... It's awesome. Um, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee you. And then he says, come near to God and he will come near to you. And um, I just thought it was cool when I was reading it. Just thinking of whatever you're drawing near to is... Like if you draw near to the devil, like he's going to play into that. Like he's not going to ignore that you could almost flip this um in reverse and say like if you draw draw near the devil the devil will draw near to you right if you resist god like god is there right and but you're gonna be further from god yeah that's what it's saying yeah (laughs) um so resist the devil did you want to read the next part (laughs) yeah wash your hands you You sinners sinners. (laughs) and purify purify your hearts you double-minded Grieve, mourn, wail. <laughs> Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So like, he's I mean, such a downer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even, it, I mean, to, to say, like, turn your, your gloom to joy, that'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, we can re- rejoice in the Lord. Yeah. But he's like, no, if you're happy, just be sad. <laughs> Bring yourself down. Um But it's cool. We'll talk about judgment a little bit there, and then he'll talk about boasting about tomorrow, which I think really runs into chapter five, because he'll, again, kind of go after, you just think you have it all under control. Mm -hmm. Like, you think you can just do whatever you want, have whatever you want, and so you're saying, tomorrow I'm going to do this, I'm going to care of my business, I'm going to make money, Mm -hmm. I'm balling, like, I do what I want. And uh, verse 17 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them, and... He'll say, like, don't boast about tomorrow. And then he gives this warning about, now listen, you rich people. <laughs> and he goes in on them about, you hoard. Yeah. You hoard for yourself. And what and you not taking care of other people with your money is a testimony against you. Like, you're, the people and the money, like, all of it's going to be a witness hmm. against you. Wow. That you don't act as though God would want you to, wow. you greedy. That's heavy. Dude. Yeah. And then he'll move to patience and suffering and, and a line about not um, swearing by anything. Just, all you need to say is simple yes or no, which I think is cool. Is kind of saying that if you swear by something, like, oh, I swear I'm going to do it. Like you've taken this – you're already showing that the weight of your own words aren't, aren't heavy enough, so you have to swear by something else. Yeah. And I think in doing so, you're taking even more weight away from your word. Like, you'd be better off just saying yes or saying no and then making that carry weight by doing whatever you've said. And I'm preaching myself at that point. I swear. I swear. I swear I'm going to do it. <laughs> if you just said yes and you were good for your word, people wouldn't have to – you wouldn't feel like the need to swear by something. Yeah. That's why I tell everyone no. You swear by it? Yeah. <laughs> don't swear by it. I like, swear I'm not going to do, do it. it. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want to not come through and have yeah. my word not carry weight. Um, I love the, the last little part. Yeah, of it. I was trying to move us to that. Yeah. It says this. Um, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? 
Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So what do you think that means, Russ? He's given some context on on when you're going through things, we're going through them together on one level, right? That's cool, yeah. Is anyone among you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that we're supposed to be among each other? It's cool. Um, and then if you're in trouble, you should pray. I mean, I think he's pretty self-explanatory on some of it. Is, is anybody happy? Let him sing. Like he's saying, like, let him, let him be happy. Um, if there's, like he's saying, like, let's deal with things where they're at, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. So trouble, pray about it. Happy, praise about it. Sick, Pray about it. You know what I mean? Like he's just going down this list kind of and then saying like we pray about it because we believe that that has – it makes a difference um, so that we should believe wholeheartedly and watch God move in those ways. And then it kind of – it even speaks on it a little bit and explains it in verse 17. It, it's I heavy. This. I mean it's really heavy. Yeah. It says Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Like they go from there's power in praying to also saying Elijah prayed and didn't rain for three and a half years, and he's a human like you. Mm-hmm. So your prayer can be powerful too. So that's what I'm going to be praying for. The rain to suffer three and a half years. You just want us all to be in a drought and have everything die in the Northwest. Prove awesome. to you once and for all. Well, my praying is going to be for it to rain. So it'll be a prayer battle. <laughs> and then they just cancel each other out. It'll be normal normal weather weather for the next three and a half years, guys. (laughs) Don't worry about it. (laughs) Um, But this last two verses are really cool, too. Yeah, I just want to spend more time in that. Are are we cool moving to that? No, let's move. My brothers and sisters, if anyone, excuse me, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from their error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. (laughs) What a way to end his letter, first of all. Anyways, but I think it makes sense that he ended this way on some levels because he keeps saying like, you missed it. You're dumb. Do this. You missed it. And then he ends by saying, and remember this, Mm -hmm. when somebody is in this, you should bring them back. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you're doing a good thing. You're saving them from death and covering over a multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's kind of cool that he ends it with this one last kind of line to go out with. Mm -hmm. You're going to mess up all these things I just told you because I gave you all these instructions. Mm-hmm. And when you do, you should go after each other. Mm. That's good. James with the mic drop. Yep. He's grumpy, but we love him. All right, let's move to <laughs> Peter. I love Peter's letters. Yeah. He's so... He, he writes he's interesting just ways. He's so cool. But, yeah. Um, and I love just that he was, you know, one of Jesus's like... Apostles, he writes first really well of all, for a fisherman. but we see him a lot in the Gospels because he gives the Gospel writers so much material. Totally. Um, <laughs> Good, bad, and otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Peter's all in. But I, I think it's cool that he writes and articulates so well, and he's a fisherman. Totally. Because think about how he's writing through this. Mm-hmm. I, I really like how his writing is kind of different than Paul's, too. Right. He, but, he, but he also is trying to articulate kind of similar ideas. <laughs> sure. Um. Yeah, there's definitely definitely similarities, but their writing is different. Mm-hmm. 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 Side note on the Gospels, as I was saying that, I was thinking through, he's in the Gospels a lot. Well, he was also, so Mark was the first Gospel written, and he influenced a lot of what was written, they believe, right. in in it. So, of course, he gives himself the spotlight <laughs> often. Sure. Um, so, anyways, Peter, here we go. Should probably just start at the beginning. But even if you think about... The Gospel of John, we'll get into it later. Mm -hmm. Um, John recognizes that Peter is a special disciple. Totally. But he also gives himself a lot of spotlight. Right. But he like doesn't say himself though. But I'm (laughs) saying even the the fact that one Jesus loved. Right. But I'm saying that he he did give credit to Peter in those places and then he gave credit to himself above Peter, but still. (laughs) So yeah, let's just start in in verse one. Verse one? Yeah. Just just for the intro. Cool. Just to introduce himself. Do it. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. 
exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pon- Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ mm. and sprinkled with his blood. That's Grace so awesome. and yeah. peace be yours in abundance. I mean, we could talk about just those lines for a long time. I love but, it. Um, I think it's cool that it says sanctifying work of the Spirit, and then it says to the to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Mm-hmm. So sprinkled with His blood is like this cleansing forgiveness, right? And then also though you're not just cleansed by Christ, but you're to live in obedience. Mm-hmm. To Christ, and just he just comes out the gates like that. Yeah, but I think theme of his letters. Totally. I mean, yeah. he does a good job in writing. Yeah, yeah. Like he's he's telling you where he's headed, mm-hmm. um, even before he'll do so. I love that he brings in all of these, all of not all of. You, I don't know if you could say the most prominent purposes of each person of the Trinity, but some of the more prominent sure, there's purposes: the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, that we see all played one. out. Yeah. The foreknowledge of the Father, like. And you see that in scripture where God the Father is like kind of the the yeah, at the at the really the top of the Godhead of planning and purposing and and then you see the Spirit doing the kind the, of what his role is in it. Mm-hmm, yeah. The sanctifying work of the Spirit. The Spirit leads us to, to Jesus. Yeah. And and that we should be obedient and sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, which was the purpose not the purpose, one of Jesus' purposes through Saving us. Right. I think it's cool. Very cool. Where do you want to go? I mean, it's tough. The, the first, uh, the next really uh, six-ish verses are pretty pretty huge. Um, huge. <laughs> talking about assurance uh, in, in the faith, um, and he kind of brings in a lot of different ideas. I don't think we need to um, read through the entire Mm-mm. thing. Maybe let's um, just talk about the topic of it real quick. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can read the first couple. <laughs> Praise to God. So we are reading it. <laughs> uh, pra- <laughs> Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Um he he goes on to just talk about the assurance in faith that um, because of uh, God's work in choosing and, and saving you um, through Jesus, that trials that you face are to refine your faith. And he'll go on to, and we'll, we'll read in the later weeks, he'll talk about suffering and what mm-hmm. suffering does to our faith. Yeah. Um, and so he has this really cool line. In verse seven, mm-hmm. um, where he he says um, that these have come so that the uh, proven gener- genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through, uh, even though refined by fire. I can't talk. <laughs> Man, this or verse read. is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May these result- have come so that the proven genuineness <laughs> of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Mm -hmm. There, now explain it. (laughs) Perfect. Um, I think it's just, it's it's awesome that all of the refining of our faith, still God gets the glory. Yeah. And that these, uh, you you nailed earlier that these these things come and and they come so that there's a genuineness of faith. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, when you boil it down, when you get off all the other stuff, Mm -hmm what's left. Right, right. And that life sometimes can burn everything else away. I mean, you can feel like you're at the bottom, but if you're at the bottom with God, you're good. Mm. You know what I mean? And so um, there's this idea, like you said, of refining fire, like you're going through it and and it, anything that's not faith, that's, that's, you know, it's giving the example of gold. When you're refining gold, everything else is burned away. Mm-hmm. And so anything other than faith in those moments burns out. So if there isn't real faith, that burns out too. Yeah, yeah, Maybe nothing comes through the fire. Hmm. And so it's just a hard thing to kind of work through, but it's a, it's a cool line. Um, and it helps us understand for those that have their faith in Jesus that those times can 
man, they can feel hard, but then at least I, I know where I stand. Man, I do have this. Sure. I got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So um, then he goes on to talk about being holy. Yeah. Um, you should read it. Yeah, you should. Um, we love you guys. Love you. See you Thanks next week. Thanks for joining us. We'll yeah. see you next week. Peace. Thank you for listening to this week's Engage Bible Podcast. We pray it is a blessing to you. We encourage you to go now and participate in your own reading of Scripture and engage with fellow believers in Bible conversations. As a reminder, you can access and print a copy of the Engage Bible Reading Plan at engage.theroots.church.